right, so this is an emergency message for the surviving members of Rush and for Dave Grohl. I will explain. Rush bassist Getty Lee uh, recently did an interview with the Washington Post about a day or so or two days before I'm taping this in November of 2023, where he opened the door to the possibility of he and uh, his and Rush guitarist Alex Lifeson doing something under the name Rush in the absence of Neil Peart, who passed away in 2016. Basically carrying on in some way, shape, or form. Now, he wasn't clear whether this would be like uh, uh, just some live dates. I'll read you the quote. So, um... It had been a taboo subject, Getty Lee said, and playing those songs again with a third person was the elephant in the room, and that kind of disappeared. So then the question is, is raised, so would a potential Rush reunion work with another drummer? Getty Lee continued, It was nice to know that if we decide to go out, Alex and I, whether we went out as a part of a new thing, or whether we just wanted to go out and play Rush as Rush, we could do that now. And so the whole reason Getty Lee was doing this interview. He's he's promoting a new book and a, a, a documentary with a, that he's like the, the, the central person in this documentary about bass. Good friend of mine, my friend Neil, is going to see Getty Lee do a speaking appearance, reading from his new book soon. But the whole thing that got him and Alex Lifeson to warm up to this possibility was that they played the Taylor Hawkins tribute show organized by Foo Fighters leader Dave Grohl after Taylor Hawkins, uh, Foo Fighters drummer Taylor Hawkins passed away. So I have a message for Lee and Lifeson and I have a message for Dave Grohl and this is an emergency taping. Okay, so on first hearing about this, a friend of mine sent me a message I think it was like the last night or the night before last. And yeah, it was late last night. And he was like, oh yeah, well now that Rush, you know, Getty Lee's been saying, and I'm like, they're not gonna, they're not gonna, they're not gonna do that. No, 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 they won't do that. They have, surely they have the sense <laughs> not to carry on as Rush without this, this 100,000% integral part of what their band was. I must say, Rush is one of the first bands I fell in love with as a teenager. I've said this in other videos, but my friend Wilson Rodriguez was an older Puerto Rican guy in my neighborhood, six years older than me. I was really into Van Halen. This would have been 1985 or so. And he goes, Van Halen's awesome, but put this on. And he, and he puts headphones on my head while I'm standing in the doorway of my mom's apartment, like the apartment I grew up in in the South Bronx, in this, on the Grand Concourse in the Bronx. And I'm standing there. He's about to like leave. We're just chit-chatting in the doorway. And I hear Tom Sawyer and fall in love with Rush from that moment on. Now, I must also say, Neil Peart is not even my favorite aspect of Rush of their whole thing. I have at times personally found his drumming a little bit on the stiff side, a little bit on the premeditated side, but who cares? There's plenty of his drumming that I love anyway, and it doesn't matter. <laughs> like my personal, you know, where I fall with each of them as players, you can't do Rush without Neil Peart. Now, what I would love for them to do, and this is a suggestion, and I hope all the Rush fans out there will propagate this idea, and I'm hoping somehow, you know, on a snowball's chance in hell, has a chance to somehow get across somebody who has the ear of somebody who has the ear of the decision makers in Rush's camp. I hope. This is like a Hail Mary like I said, throwing a snowball in into hell and hoping that it gets caught. Here's what I would propose. I think the perfect thing to do 
is for the band to tour under the name Rush as a tribute to Neil Peart. They could call it one of their fucking geeky ass nicknames for one another that they loved calling each other. Or the, or one of the n- n- many nicknames they had for him, specifically. Or they could do something a little more, um, with a little more finesse and draw lyrics. Base the name of the show on one of his lyrics on the fleeting temporality and importance of valuing the time that you have in life which 90% of his songs are about anyway particularly once he started to grieve his wife and his daughter later in their career they could do something like that now what I'm proposing is instead of one drummer assemble like a core of drummers and you tour with them, like maybe four or five of them, and each one gets their section of the show. You maybe make it like a two-hour thing, two-hour, 15 minutes, something like that, and each one gets a section. And this would enable the band, the surviving two members, Getty and Alex, to have this... What could, what I would presume would be a wonderful experience with their fan base to say goodbye to this, to Neil Peart, but also for them to come to terms with the end of the band. And I don't know these two guys. I don't know how they grieve. I don't, I'm not in that position to know if that's how you would even grieve something, the loss of someone like that who's in your band and who's close to you because apparently they were close and they were still very friendly with one another up until the very end. So I'm not sure if that's how they would process this. But it does sound like they've been in a kind of, kind of like the fog and the shock of grief or something like it, this kind of change, like this, this sudden cold water in the face of mortality and they've been like they were not feeling open or ready to even entertain the idea and now they are so it sounds like you could process all of this in this kind of celebration of life and work of your departed bandmate if you bring a few different drummers in it creates this intrigue it creates this um, variation, this sort of topography to the show, right? And you talk to each drummer like, well, what, what's your favorite stuff that you want to play? What's your, what do you, what would you want? Would you want to do a double drum solo? Would you want all four of these dudes out there? You know, you could do something really special. And this would be, of course, a thrill to... Many, 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 many drummers would be like, oh my God. Even really established drummers I'm talking about would be like, oh my God. I would, to be able to do that would just blow my mind, right? And it would be a challenge too. And they could egg each other on or support each other, right? If they're nervous, if they're like, oh my God, like I'm playing Neil Peart's drum parts. Fuck, these are huge shoes to fill. They could support each other and also egg each other on. It could have a really awesome dynamic. It'd be like a drum corps traveling review celebration of Neil Peart's life and work with Rush, (laughs) right? So here's who I would propose. I'm I'm sure I'm going to think of tons of people or, or a handful of people at least after I'm done. Maybe I should go backwards, in backwards order. Um, I guess I'm going to start with people who I'm not sure would be in contention. And in fact, two of them I know would not be in contention. So these are sort of no-brainer choices of people who I'm not sure. Two of them have officially retired. And then two of them, I'm not sure whether they, they're they in the right time in their lives to do it. So I'm talking about Bill Bruford and Phil Collins if they would even consider it, would would be awesome, but they've retired. 
Vinny Kaliuta, I think, would be perfect. And Chester Thompson would be even more perfect. Chester Thompson, of course, replaced Phil Collins in Genesis when Phil Collins, or as, as Genesis' live touring drummer, when Phil Collins came to the front and became their front man. So there's that. My, I guess I'll go, go backwards, right? So my number five choice is somebody who I think might surprise people. I'm not even sure whether this would be the right fit for him, but I think he's versatile enough. He has shown that he's versatile enough, and that would be Dave Lombardo from Slayer. If you haven't checked out his latest solo record, which is like all over the map, somehow I feel like he would be able to... I think there's a good chance he would bring a really interesting touch to Neil Peart's music. My next choice who I'd like to nominate would be an obvious one. It'd be Tim Herb Alexander from Primus. Primus has connections with Rush. Primus band leader Les Claypool is friends with Getty Lee, like personal friends, like they go fishing together. Primus has covered Rush albums in their entirety, or at least uh, Farewell to Kings. They recently toured, like during the pandemic, doing that whole record. It's, seems like an obvious choice. My next choice is another fairly obvious one, would be Danny Carey from Tool. He has the, the chops, the dexterity, the grasp of technicality, and he also has a real fluid quality about his drumming and an appreciation for like um, certain types of auxiliary percussion that I think would really augment or slot into very nicely with what the little other touches that Neil Peart would add to Rush's songs. So I think that's another kind of no-brainer. My top choice. I mean, ideally, I would want all these people. <laughs> My top choice would be Jimmy Chamberlain from Smashing Pumpkins. To me, this is like the ideal person to, or at least you would think, to <sighs> carry these songs bring a certain drive to them, but also a real precision that I think matches Neil Peart's level of precision perfectly. Now, here's the issue. If they were to do this kind of traveling thing, this, this package, it would have to be drummers that people know, marquee level drummers, not that they would have any trouble filling the seats. I mean, their fans would eat this up. But it, but it would, to really sell the show, it's got to have marquee players. I'm sure there are tons of people who would actually be perfect for this job. You would have to balance between finding someone who is technical enough in their approach, but also not be so literal that you're stuck in the exact same kind of slot as Neil Peart with someone who adheres too closely and is actually not still not as uh, um, enjoyable to watch or as thrilling to watch because it's like a it's like you can't imitate you can't match this person so you have to bring some measure of what they do you have to bring the skill set but you have to bring someone with their own character that fits in a complementary way but also overlaps as well so it'd be like a venn diagram where like that player style overlaps with neil peart's enough but then there's this other aspects to their playing that are complementary and bring a nice new flavor and a sense of new blood to this material to me mike portnoy from dream theater is too obvious it's just way too 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 obvious and I personally wouldn't want to go see that. I wouldn't want to go see something that conservative of a choice. Now, somebody who I don't want to see. Now, I don't think they would ever even consider this person, but I feel like he would show up. And this is an emergency message from the Feedback Deaf Emergency Broadcast System. To Dave Grohl, do not show up at any of these shows. Do not Zoom the band. 
Do not get up there and talk. Do not get up there and do your thing where you kind of shuck and jive and get the crowd all excited. Do not show up. I will personally vote for anybody, <laughs> any presidential candidate who makes a campaign promise that they will issue an executive order if elected to the U.S. presidency banning Dave Grohl from being anywhere within 100 miles of any of these shows if they do end up happening. Don't even want you zoom in, bro. Don't even want you zoom. Don't even want you greeting the crowd. Don't even want you phoning in a message. You need to be quiet. Yes, Getty and Alex now are feeling open to this because thanks in large thanks in part to you or thanks to you but you got to know your place i'm going to fucking be like the the chief from the pink panther movies clues up 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 dave girl dave 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 girl dave 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 girl is dave girl here <laughs> that's going to fucking be me if this dude so much as puts his dirty mitts on this event. You need to stay home or take your daughters to the show, be in the crowd or stand on the side, keep your mouth shut. There's a certain decorum to this kind of thing and I'm going to break it down for you, okay? Let me first say, the same goes for Jack Black. In fact, if the Rush fans want to start a crowdfunding campaign to ship Jack Black in a gorilla costume on a cargo ship to the end of the fucking earth, if he so much as shows up and does his whole sh ham it up kind of shtick, the majesty of rock kind of thing, if he does that thing, I would applaud it. There's no amount of money too high that is not worth keeping these two dudes away from this event and i'm being serious here this is serious shit little basic etiquette okay i know dave grohl spoke at lemmy's funeral i feel like his presence was totally appropriate at the chris cornell tribute concert in fact i think he should have done a lot more talking there where he actually really knew this person as a friend. Okay? Where there was more of a basis for you to be speaking. I think he should have done a lot more talking at the Taylor Hawkins tribute show instead of like, you know, playing hot for teacher when there was murmurs out there. At least the idea was out there. I'm not saying this is true. But at least the idea was out there that it was in part that you might have played some role in the death of Taylor Hawkins because of the quotes that Matt Cameron from Soundgarden slash Pearl Jam gave. And then he was mad at the he was upset at the journalist who quoted him when actually he was really upset at himself for getting too comfortable with the journalist and saying what he really felt. And they're like, oh, no, no, no you quoted me out of context. No, actually, it didn't sound like it was out of context at all. It sounded like. It was the fucking truth, and he felt like he shouldn't have disclosed that to the public. And then the journalist ran with it because he didn't say to the journalist, this is off the record. Now, journalists should, me being one of them, you know, I've never gotten a scoop quite that massive. But I have been in situations where I've made the call, you know what, I'm not going to share this because this would do damage to relationships with this person and... And there's other times where I just don't think the fans should know some of the dirt because it's going to mar their appreciation for the music. I don't think this was one of those cases, okay? I think it was important that Hawkins was expressing, at least to Cameron, that there was some exhaustion, some thing going on there where he didn't want to keep going. And then with that out there, you end up throwing a tribute where you play with all these rock people and this is how you show 
I don't know. Something about that makes me uncomfortable now. You could say he played hot for teacher with Wolfgang Van Halen. Wolfgang, obviously Eddie Van Halen's son. Eddie Van Halen passed away fairly recently. Maybe there's something that I'm not seeing. Clearly all the people who participated in this event, all the musicians, would probably be like, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Why are you going to be so negative? Why do you have to read something? Um, I guess, um, why do you have to read something potentially suspicious into what was going on? This was just kind of us paying homage to one of our peers who's no longer with us. The performances were fun. There was something about it that still struck me as kind of hammy in a way that felt almost inappropriate. Now, interestingly enough, I got into a, a, a friendly back and forth debate right when it was announced that Taylor Hawkins passed away. They were supposed to do that gig, I believe it was in Chile. And what I would have liked to have seen the Foo Fighters do is, okay, have a huddle and be like, okay, look. This is not a case of the show must go on. This is not that, okay? This dude just died in the hotel right before we're supposed to do this gig. But all these people are here. We are totally blindsided. We don't even know what the fuck. We're still in shock. We're still trying to process this. Why don't we call a drummer who we know, fly them down here, try to rehearse some kind of set, make an announcement on Instagram and via our publicist, look, we're going to do this show. It's more going to be about sharing this with you. We have no idea what's going to happen. It could be a fucking train wreck. We could break down and cry. We could say, look, I can't do this anymore. We got to go home. We just wanted to spend this moment with you. Because you heard this and we heard this and we're all here. At the same time, processing this as fans and as bandmates together. I thought that would have been really sweet. Now my friend, dear friend of mine, who goes by the name Nuge. No relation to Ted Nugent. <laughs> um, was like, no, you can't do that, man. You, you don't know what's... You don't know what you're feeling. You don't know what's liable to to, to, to surface <laughs> while you're in this completely fresh stage of shock. You know? I still think it would have been a nice gesture. Just give it a try. Or even just pull a bunch of um, chairs up and talk to the crowd. Do a Q&A. Dave Grohl is always presenting as that right that would have been to me the perfect opportunity to actually be that for his fans maybe bring some acoustics be like we have no idea what's going to happen here this is raw we're still feeling raw some of us are in a fucking daze we've been to a grief counselor we may be here for 20 minutes we may be here with y'all for the next two hours we have no idea that would have been cool I think that would have been a lovely thing for both them and the fans. I don't know how much these people want to bring the fan base into something like that, though, and I don't know that they have to. I'm totally in support of them deciding, look, we can't, we just can't do this. We gotta go home. <laughs> we gotta clear our heads. But then, you know, within months, Foo Fighters announce <clears throat> we got more dates. And yes, they're a business. Yes, many, many families depend on them to keep going. The band, the crew, all these people have, you know, families to support. I understand that. But just something about that. And then with that announcement and the tribute shows, it just doesn't, just didn't sit well. I'm not saying Dave Grohl is insincere. Very few of us who have ever lived in the history of the world understand what it's like to be as famous as this person there is clearly an element to him that likes and feels more comfortable relating to people where they're at it's probably the case where the ideal fate for him would have been to be in a band that was like 
known but a lot less famous like the kind of band that could play like a club and he could have been hanging at the bar eating like a veggie sandwich or something chit chatting with people for 20 minutes before he had to go sound check that's probably where he would have been most suited instead he's in this ginormodome <laughs> behemoth two two in a row bands at that stature and he's trying to find some way to preserve that aspect of who he is in a way that feels relatable i mean there's the the, the beautiful gesture he made once i don't remember the name of the town i should have looked this up but there was a town in italy like a remote wasn't like a major city where like something like a hundred people did a cover version of learning to fly with a bunch of string instruments. It's really, really lovely. You can look it up on YouTube. I'll post the link. And they decided, we're, Dave Grohl said, we're playing a show for them. See, that's the kind of thing that really speaks to the heart, okay? I will also say, I love Dave Grohl's drumming in Nirvana. I... I actually really am enjoying Dave Grohl's autobiography, both in written form and in spoken form. And when I was listening to his autobiography on Audible, I'm like, man, this guy's a really great storyteller. I was even watching a recent clip of him with, um, this is very recent as I'm taping this, him with Conan O'Brien, Chris Novoselic, and In Utero producer Steve Albini. They were talking about the new 30th anniversary edition of In Utero. Great to listen to these guys talk he's an excellent storyteller i wish what he would do personally what i would love to see dave Grohl do that i think he would be fucking awesome at is do like radio theater like like radio plays basically or whatever the the modern equivalent of that would be i think he would be amazing i think as he gets older and he gets to be like orson wells's age or whatever dude needs to be on the fucking radio but but doing theater not just talking to us about rock and roll i want to see this dude play characters right and this is my issue with him and with jack black and with rivers cuomo from weezer they sell us back the myth of rock and roll when we are already bought into the music why are you reselling me something that I've already opted in for, at least on the uh, at the level of the music. Why do you need to do this shuck and jive, this whole populism shtick? I'm a man of the people, and I'll play you the rock stuff, man. Let's rock out. Let's play Rick Astley. Let's, you know... It's just like, I can discern <laughs> what fucking classic rock and pop I like, and I don't need... Jack Black to kind of do a little performance about Ronnie James Dio or do a little performance about Rush. I mean, you know, he's in the Rush documentary. Jack Black, his observation about like Getty Lee and Alex Lifeson joking around with each other while Near Peer is off in his own more serious headspace. I thought that was very, very astute. But it came with this like layer of shtick to it. It's like, dude, can you just shut that off? Yes, we fucking know you're a comedian, okay? But when you're always on, why, like, you are an artificial presentation. And then when you're talking about these people who I listen to or other people really love, we don't need you to sell us back the myth. I was listening to Ronnie Dio, like, when I was, like, 13, 12, actually. Who the fuck are you to then now act like, like, do this sort of drag show parody of what it means to be a metalhead? Why is it that you don't know the difference between loving something and making fun of it or satirizing it? If I wanted satire, if I wanted the majesty of rock, I would just fucking watch Spinal Tap do the majesty of rock. Which, in fact, they did do that song. At the Freddie Mercury tribute show, I believe that was at Wembley Stadium, if I'm not mistaken, in 1992 or three, And I believe it's Nigel Tufnell, Christopher Guest, 
who says, tonight we're going to cut our set by about 35 songs. And then Derek Smalls, Harry Shearer, says, perfectly timed. Freddie would have liked it that way. Now that is how you fucking do a tribute with good taste and humor. You don't blur the line between, oh, I love Ronnie James Dio, but I'm too self-conscious and I know other people have this sense of what heavy metal means to them. So I'm going to embody something that is almost a caricature of heavy metal, but embrace the caricature instead of embracing the whoa, 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 whoa. We don't need to do all that. I don't need your fucking rock myth. I don't need you to sell me a rock myth, Dave Grohl and Rivers Cuomo and Jack Black, because you are having a hard time tapping into that younger adolescent version of yourself that was really enthralled by rock music and felt this amazing thing. And you've been in this business so long that it's probably difficult for you to preserve that. This is me speculating, of course. I'm not in your shoes, but I would wager... Maybe not my bottom dollar, but I would wager some dollars. I'd certainly wager your money. <laughs> that this has something to do with it. That it's a bit of a shtick. It's a bit, it's like stale. It's like Vegas. When you go to see Weezer and they're like, just, you know, trying to act like they're like teenagers who are really into rock music, man. Come the fuck on. And I don't need that at the Rush show. And I don't want you anywhere near the Rush show. Please go and enjoy the show. And keep your fucking mouth shut like anybody should. You may know Getty Lee and Alex Lifeson, but you are not in their inner circle. I'm not saying that as a fan I am either. But you don't need to insinuate yourself into that equation. You are probably not the most dedicated Rush fan. Okay. So don't sort of yuck it up and be like, yeah, 2112, man. Don't just, 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 just be quiet. Okay? There is a decorum to this. I remember when Robin Williams passed away. Robin Williams was one of the leads in one of my two favorite movies of all time. He's a film directed by Terry Gilliam named The Fisher King. This is one of my all-time favorite movies. It's one of my two favorite films ever. This film means... It's like in my heart. But I didn't feel like... Oh, it's so sad. It's so sad. It's, it's like... What's so sad? What's sad to me... This guy has a fucking family... This guy has loved ones that he left behind who are feeling real grief. You are feeling like this person who made something you loved. Like you lost something. Except guess what? You got to keep everything they made. Now, if you are lamenting the fact that this person, you were dying to see what his next uh, cinematic move was going to be, what his next film if you thought, okay, no, this guy had another 20 years. I, I wanted to see him age. I wanted to see what he would bring to the game, right? What he would bring to his craft. That's a different story. But even when, I, even when like Scott Weiland and when Chris Cornell passed away, those are two of the only people who've passed away that I did feel an actual sense of like sadness and being on the verge of tears. And with Chris Cornell, I actually did cry. But it took, it took seeing a video from the crowd at a U2 show where they played the song Black Hole Sun over the PA before coming on. And then it hit me because I was like, man, this was in the music all along. There was something in this music. There was an, a grief in this music that I had not acknowledged, that I had not heard coming from this person. And that led me to tears. But we have to be careful of what's ours versus what isn't. And for us as fans, we don't have the same sense of grief for Neil Peart even as the people who, who actually knew him. It's inappropriate for us to claim that. On the other hand, it's fucking inappropriate for Dave Grohl to kind of act like he's in their same boat and, and to act that way towards us. He does not know what Rush fans have lost. 
with Neil Peart dying, he can approximate it. Well, I'm not going to say he doesn't know. I'm saying he most likely does not feel that. He can approximate it. He's been in a band where somebody died prematurely. Okay? So, I'm sure he has some sense of it, but it's not his. This is not the place for you to come and MC, and it is certainly not the place for you to even think about. Don't even walk in the fucking direction of that drum kit or security needs to tackle your ass and put you on the same cargo container as Jack Black. For real. Don't do it, bro. Don't fucking... Come on, man. Listen. Dave Grohl has as much business sitting behind the drum set at a Neil Peart or Rush-themed event as I have flying a 747 blindfolded. Or putting some ice skates on and doing a fucking Barishnikov routine when I don't even know how to ice skate. That's a little extreme. All right, now let me back it up. I love Dave Grohl's drumming in Nirvana. Love it. I do not think Dave Grohl or I do not think Nirvana is any lesser than Rush. I do not think that style of drumming is less than Neil Peart's drumming. And I think Nirvana didn't leave behind as much music for obvious reasons. So you can measure it that way. But in terms of the value of the music, I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm not saying Neil Peart is even better than Dave Grohl. You might like Dave Grohl more because he has a fuck ton of feeling. It's a little too hard for my liking, but I mean, there's there's a live video and album that was uh, released in a couple different formats. First, it was a video. It was an MTV broadcast. I believe it was New Year's Eve 1993 going into 1994 that they Nirvana recorded in a warehouse on the water in Seattle, like, a, like on a pier somewhere. It wasn't even a venue. And... This was aired on MTV, then it was released on video, and then in 2021 or so, somewhere in the 2020, 2020, 2021, they released it as a standalone CD. It's called Live and Loud, which is like the dumbest title. But it's... There you really get to see, man, this guy's drumming. Holy shit. (laughs) He is... Like, when I can receive i don't i don't i tend to not like drummers that hit super hard even in heavy music even the most heavy 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 shit i don't like drummers that like just pound away but so what (laughs) objectively and and i can feel i'm like man this guy what like he was in his element in this band and here's the thing let's say dave grohl god forbid started to get joint problems or arthritis or something or something happened. He's like, you know what? Listen, I'm going to do one last set of shows and we're going to celebrate. I'm going to celebrate my body of work with you and I'm going to bring a bunch of drummers with me. Or let's say Phil Rudd from ACDC retired. One of my favorite drummers ever, ACDC, Phil Rudd. Everybody talks about Phil Rudd being simple, so so simple, so simple, so simple. Yeah, yeah, like Scott Ian said about Malcolm Young from ACDC, you try playing that shit. Okay, there's no fills. Try getting the feel right. Okay, so say say there was an AC, the Phil Rudd retirement tribute thing, or say there was a Dave Grohl tribute thing. I'm not sure that I want Dave Grohl playing the Phil Rudd tribute. I wouldn't want Bron Daler from Mastodon or Tomas Hawk from Meshuggah or John Clardy from Terra Mellos or Dave Turncrantz from Russian Circles or Dave Witte, who's a really awesome underground metal drummer or Chris Penny, the original drummer from the Dillinger Escape Plan or if you want to go to jazz, Emmanuel Wilkins, EJ Strickland I wouldn't want them to play a Dave Grohl tribute show. I wouldn't have wanted Neil Peart, if he were alive, to play a Dave Grohl tribute show. Be like, well, yeah, we want some variety, but that's 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 
too far apart from the lane that you're in. And it's not because certain people play certain styles that I think they wouldn't be a good match. I think there are certain jazz drummers and I think there are certain technical metal drummers who can play rock and roll really well. Nika Anderson from Entombed, who used to be, and actually still is, a kick-ass death metal drummer. If you listen to the albums Left Hand Path and Clandestine and their recent re like live recordings of that material, it's, it's fucking killer. I mean, he can play rock and roll. I don't think Igor Cavalera, who is one of my favorite drummers, can play straight rock and roll or even hardcore very well. I suspect Dave Lombardo can. Dave King from the Bad Plus, the jazz band that was rose to fame doing all those rock covers and I think quite poorly, me personally. Dave King is another basher. I saw the Bad Plus recently, which will be a separate video. And I was very pleasantly surprised that he doesn't just pound the shit out of his drums anymore. Perhaps he would be at a Dave Grohl tribute show. Cool, let's get the guy from the Bad Plus. That'd be interesting. You know, there's certain people where, like I said, it's a Venn diagram. There's enough of an overlap that it works and enough of a difference that you're not being too literal. Now, as far as etiquette and decorum... Again, I thought what Dave Grohl did, playing an Audio Slave song, Nail in My Hand from My Creator, Show Me How to Live is the name of the song. He played that with some of the guys from Audio Slave, and he sang it at the Chris Cornell tribute show, and I thought he did an excellent job. I thought that was really tasteful. But I mean, Metallica... <laughs> Metallica shows up, and they do a, a, an obscure early career deep cut they covered a Soundgarden song named All uh, All Your Lies from the first Soundgarden full length. I consider it their second album, but it, Ultra Mega OK is the name of the album. And it's like, oh, cool, cool, cool. They Wow. They, and they, they actually did, they concentrated, <laughs> they like did a full, faithful rendition. I was like, oh, wow, cool. And then what do they do? They do a fucking mini set of their own songs. It's like somebody had to ask them, somebody had to have asked them to do that because even for those fucking bozos who are like in, at a level of like a rarefied fame that I'm sure causes brain damage, clearly it has considering their choices since about 1991. For you to show up at someone else, at a tribute show to a deceased musician and play your own songs... It's like, what the fuck? Like, surely even you guys can't be this dense. Somebody must have said, hey, can you throw in a couple of Metallica songs just to please the crowd? Because, I mean, that just struck me as so, like, like, outrageously inappropriate. It'd be like if you showed up to a funeral of someone you knew and one of your mutual friends... I was like, hey, was being real loud, like, yeah, yeah. And they were like showing off their new car or something. Or they were showing off something in their collection. And it's like, dude, time and place, time and place, hello? Time and fucking place? Is this really the time and the place for you to be doing that? For you to be playing Master of Puppets? Were they making a statement playing Master of Puppets? To say something about Chris Cornell's death, which would be, I think, even a little bit kind of cringy. Or did they not even fucking consider that the words might have had something to do? Or did Chris Cornell love that song and they knew and they did it for him? Or did someone, maybe Dave Grohl, maybe he requested? I don't know, but it just, it's just like, come the fuck on. And so Dave Grohl being loud at these events, it seems like he pops up wherever something like this takes place, he's going to be there. Kind of emceeing and, and being the, the the circus, whatever you call that, ringleader, announcer, whatever you call it. Be Like emceeing these major uh, um, rituals of like, you know, honoring people who die. It's just it's like, why is this your job? Who elected you to do this? 
all the time. And, you know, again, I remember when, I think it was when Kobe Bryant played his last game in L.A. At the L.A. Forum or whatever the fuck that place is called, Bitcoin Arena or whatever, whatever. And Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers played the national the national anthem on bass. Flea is a massive <laughs> LA Lakers fan. So that made sense. But if you put together like a, a like a team, like an, a dream team slash all-star team, a five or ten NBA, former NBA players, like retired NBA players. To honor Kobe Bryant. Do you think Flea would be suiting up into a basketball uniform? No, he fucking wouldn't. Because he would know that's not the lane for me. That's not where I'm my skill set is most um reflective of the person who we're honoring. Now, if it's a Jaco Pastorius or someone like that, or if like there's ever a tribute show to Les Claypool, by all means, do it. Or even some of the punk bands that the Chili Peppers came up with when they were considered like a fringe punk funk act. Like Norwood from Fishbone, right? Say there was a Fishbone, say Fishbone retired and there was a Fishbone tribute. Of course, of course, Flea would be one of the first people who should be involved in that kind of thing. But you kind of got to know your place. We all could stand to do that. And I think we all have a sense of, well, at certain occasions, I'm not going to be loud and make this about me. And I'm not saying that's what Dave Grohl is intentionally trying to do or that Jack Black is intentionally trying to do. My guess is that they're actually trying to relate. They're actually trying to give us something, is my guess. I would not be surprised if that's what was going on. But just hang back a little. That's all. And Dave Grohl, don't. Go to the show. Don't do it. Stay home. Or go in the crowd in disguise. Wear a wig. Sit there with your daughter. Take in the music without you having to say something. We don't all speak at funerals or celebrations of life. You kind of read the room and know when to say when. And for God's sake, don't. Get behind the drum set. Getty Lee and Alex Lifeson will probably feel too polite to tell you no. They'll probably invite you to do it. That's when it's your time to shine. Your drum solo, your moment is going to be, you know what, guys? I'm going to sit this one out. I'm going to leave this to you and the fans and Jimmy Chamberlain and whoever else you have, all these other drummers. I'm going to sit this one out. I'm just going to enjoy this and take this in. That's your moment to shine. Because to quote Neil Peart himself, philosophers and plowmen, each must know his part to mold a new reality closer to the heart. Okay? This is from my heart, Dave Grohl. This is from my heart. I I think I speak on behalf of all Rush fans. A lot of us love what you do. And love what you do in only the way you know how to do it. And that's amazing, man. But let's not try to do too much here. If this goes on, if this goes forward and there is a rush, an evening of Neil Peart or whatever, a Lurkston, Texas, or whatever the fuck they're going to call it. Lurkston is Alex Lifeson as all rush geeks know. But I don't even, the professor, whatever, whatever nicknames they had for him. Or if it's going to be like, Trailing the vapors, or whatever, whatever, whatever you you know, you know something to honor his lyrics about his own grief. You know, maybe they can call it something like that. They can have a cool T-shirt with the counterparts, and one of the counterparts is like sort of in just an outline only, and it doesn't have Dave Grohl's face on it. Okay. What I want to hear if this event goes forward. If somehow, in hope against all hope, if somehow in the 10 million to one chance that someone gets wind of this suggestion and Rush starts to consider, 
Yeah, maybe we should tour with like a a, a, a battery of drummers. And this goes forward, and Dave Grohl's backstage at the Hollywood sh- or the LA show. The most meaningful drum solo you will ever play in your life, Dave Grohl, will be the one you don't play at this show. Come on, you can do this. I have faith in you. For feedback, Def, I'm Sebi Ray Kulkarni, the apostate music journalist. Thanks for hanging with me. This is a video I'm going to ask you to spread around. Spread this fucking video around. If you agree with me, if you think this is a worthy cause, start a fucking crowdfunded campaign. Dave Grohl, stay home. Dave Grohl, stay home. Jack Black, stay home. Jack Black, stay home. Dave Grohl, stay home. Jack Black, stay home. Strap yourself into a chair. Duct tape your mouth. Sit and watch and resist the temptation to ham up the spotlight. Which I'm not saying that's all that you're doing. I'm not, I'm not accusing you of that. Just even when we don't want to do that, sometimes we decide not to say anything because we don't want to be perceived that way by the person's loved ones. We don't want them to misinterpret where we're coming from. See, that's part of it too. Just because you have a microphone doesn't mean you need to use it. I'm sure people will say the same thing to me. I'd love to hear your comments. Please do. I've never asked for this before in any of my other videos. Please repost this video far and wide. All right. And Dave Grohl, please talk to your agent about doing radio theater. The world needs your, your gifts in that area. I'm serious about that. Hope to see, I hope this rush thing happens, and I hope to be there. And if Dave Grohl shows up, I'm going to start twitching like the guy from the Pink Panther. All right, over and out. Thanks.